Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, well, the Florida, Florida Surgeon General is at it again. Uh, he stated that the new COVID vaccine push is anti-human and was a major safety concern. And he would not recommend the vaccine to any living being on this planet. Turns out, luckily, he's on another planet, so we're okay. Everybody on Earth can get their vaccine. So, uh, you know, he did point out, and I think it's reasonable to try to address these, these uh, folks, uh, we do not have a randomized control trial for the data on the updated COVID vaccine. Uh, and that's true. We didn't have it last year either. And we don't have it for every flu vaccine every year that we update. And so to make that a criteria for not getting the vaccine seems uh, pretty silly. What, what the FDA does once the platform is safe, deemed safe based on all of the, uh, the reports on complications, once it's deemed safe, then minor changes in the vaccine are approved to better match the circulating strains. Uh, and we do have in vitro data for its immunogen immunogenicity. But I have to say, a number of you have written me and said, you know, is there data that the vaccines actually work? And I think people have forgotten the original process uh, of vaccine approval. So let's just take a, a little trip through memory lanes. Back in 2021, remember, we were one of the lead centers for the, the, the study for the Moderna trial. There were 30,000 volunteers who were enrolled in a phase three randomized uh, observer-blinded placebo-controlled trial that was produced in 99 different centers in the United States. And it was a randomization to those who got the vaccine versus those who got placebo. And COVID illness was documented in 185 participants in the placebo group and only 11 in the vaccination group, which showed a 94% uh, efficacy. More importantly, severe COVID-19 occurred in 30 participants, all of whom were unvaccinated, and the one fat fatality was in the placebo group. So there's a and that was just one of several trials, same for Pfizer. So there's, there were randomized controlled trials showing the original efficacy and safety of the vaccine. Well, then there was a lot of people who questioned, well, maybe the vaccine itself causes disease. There was, so there was a cohort study, you know, a retrospective study, looking at 6.4 million people who were vaccinated compared to 4.6 million people who were unvaccinated to look at non-COVID mortality. In other words, if the vaccine was bad for you, it would produce complications unrelated to COVID. Well, it turns out the risk was actually lower. Overall mortality was lower in the vaccinated group. Now, no, it's hard, maybe hard to explain, but maybe the vaccinated people do other things that are smart, but whatever, it was lower in the vaccinated group than the unvaccinated group. So then there are questions, well, does, you know, it's one thing to have it on a, in a randomized trial. Does it really work in, in, in real life? Well, there were a bunch of studies early on looking at nursing home recipients. They were the most at risk. 20,000 nursing home recipients received the Pfizer uh, vaccine and had a much lower mortality rate. And during the, the big Delta wave spike uh, in 2021, the mortality in unvaccinated people was 14, 14 times higher than those who were uh, vaccinated. And then if, if right now there's been data looking back at the entire pandemic over all the different strains, Delta, Omicron, Alpha, everything. And it, in retrospect, uh, if you're unvaccinated, you had two and a half times uh, more likely to die of COVID than you, if you were vaccinated. So if you look, this has been sort of looked back, how many excess deaths were happened because people were unvaccinated? And the estimate is around 200,000 people died who could have been saved had they been vaccinated, 40,000 in Texas alone. So, you know, and if you look back at Florida, Florida was leading in terms of uh, low mortality in the early parts of the pandemic. The minute they, they started coming out against the vaccine, they were one of the leading states for high mortality. So, you know, again, there's so, there's so much data to support the vaccinations. Uh, I, I'm not sure why people are still questioning it. Uh, more news about the, the boosters. Uh, already 4 million people have received an updated COVID vaccine. Uh, we had about the same um, number of people last year. And last year, about 17% of the U.S. population received an updated version of the vaccine. I hope it's more this year because it'll help, uh, it'll reduce mortality overall. If you have your card, the cards are no longer being produced by the CDC. So that white card is evidence of vaccination, but if in your workplace you need to show it in the future, 
it's going to be just like the old days with flu vaccine. You have to just get an attestation from wh whoever gave you the vaccine. And more updates. The FDA just authorized the Novavax updated uh, COVID vaccine for anyone over the age of 12. So that's a, a protein-based vaccine. So if people want to do something other than the mRNA vaccine, Novavax is available. Well, let's look at what's going on right now. Uh, if you look at respiratory virus-associated hospitalizations, you can see uh, it's sort of flat. Most of them are due to COVID. In this little green, you can begin to see RSV is beginning to tick up. If you look at the percentage of outpatient visits by age, it's interesting. Zero to four-year-old is a big group and over 65. So the zero to four group we talked about, are people, the kids you know, under the age of six months, can't be vaccinated, so it's really up to the parents, the, the pregnant mother, to be vaccinated. Uh, and RSV is a big problem uh, for this age group, and we've, we've talked about RSV vaccines available for pregnant women, and now a monoclonal antibody for kids in, who are uh, in the first six months of life. COVID hospitalizations, it's interesting here, the, these are COVID hospitalizations by year. You can see 22-23 uh, is not so bad. 2021 was really the bad year, but we're beginning to see an uptick. It's beginning to plateau, and by age, same thing, over the age of 65 for COVID. So that's really the high-risk group, the people who I really hope get their updated vaccines because they are the most risk for serious disease. Uh, nationally, viral load's about the same. It's been a plateau in terms of wastewater. 43% of, of the wastewater sites are reporting either 100% or 200% increase compared to 47% last year, but that's not really much of a change. This is the BioBot. Remember, I mentioned the CDC uh, outsources the data to them, and you can see it by their assessment, it's also fairly flat. The good news in Houston is we continue to improve. Actually, our rate has dropped down to 90% of what it was in July of 2020, down from 153% last week. And so, you know, in our region, the viral burden for COVID seems to be on the way down, I hope. Anyway, if you look at what the major variants, they really haven't changed uh, much. EG5, FL1.5, HV1, and XBB are the major variants. And if you look at, I've showed you this before, the relatedness tree, these four or five variants account for about 85% of all variants. Uh, they are derivatives of the XBB strain. Uh, the XBB 1.5 is where the vaccine is targeted to, but it is close enough related. I'm sure you'll get benefit uh, from having the vaccination. <laughs> I just got back from visiting my sister in New York. It was her birthday last week. Uh, and as I told Janet, New York City is the hot spot for a flu in the country right now. If you look, brown is is the high, very high uh, influenza activity. Rest of the country is sort of low. We're not quite in the peak season yet of flu, although you can begin to see it's beginning to tick up. Uh, I imagine we will hit it uh, November, December, January will be the big months. The good news, again, all of the sequencing shows 95% of the influenza A are H1N1, which is in the vaccine, uh, uh, and 100% uh, are Victoria in influenza B which is also in the vaccine. So that's all very, very good. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, RSV now, RSV-associated hospitalizations, it's beginning to tick up. Last year, you can see it sort of peaked in October. Remember, RSV tends to be late or late summer, early fall uh, before the flu and, and COVID sp uh, spikes. And it's beginning to go up now. You can see in this year, this is the previous years, but you can see we're just in the beginning to see a peak. And last year, it, it sort of peaked in October, November. So we'll see if we get a big spike in RSV. Mostly it's zero to four years of age. That's, we've talked about that a lot. So other kind of interesting news. So Moderna, uh, obviously the RNA vaccines have been very good for COVID. One of the great things is, is the rapidity with which they can develop them. But what about flu? I mean, flu has been a traditional recombinant protein vaccine. Uh, so M uh, Moderna is developing a combination COVID flu vaccine uh, using their mRNA technology. They, they've begun to show in vitro strong immunogenicity that's developed against influenza with the mRNA vaccine. And they are going to start a phase three trial in adults 50 years and above starting in 2023 
with the potential uh, uh, regulatory approval in 2025. So looking down the road, we're likely to see combination RNA vaccines against flu, maybe eventually RSV, but flu and, and uh, COVID are under development. And then there was a really interesting study in Nature this past week. Uh, it's well known that COVID-19 uh, provides, uh, induces an, an increased risk for cardiovascular disease in general. And it's not surprising, the, remember the receptor that brings the virus into cells is the ACE2 receptor, and that's on a lot of vascular tissue. Uh, so you would anticipate there might be an inflammatory response to the virus getting into uh, vascular tissue, and that might lead to increased atherogenicity. So this was a study looking at people who d died from severe COVID, uh, and it was an autopsy study. And so they looked for the evidence of the viral RNA in plaques, in actual plaques, and, what they, and they were able to detect it, not only in the lesions, but particularly in uh, macrophages that were loaded with cholesterol. So this is one of the, the thoughts about um, uh, atherosclerosis risk, that a chronic inflammatory response is part of the, the, in, the uh, pathogenicity of, uh, of atherosclerotic disease, and it looks like uh, you can actually find virus in those plaques. So very interesting uh, potential explanation for why there's increased cardiovascular risk with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, uh, to our VA team. Uh, we affiliated with, with v, the VA in 1947. It was our first uh, affiliate. We've been very proud of the work that's done there, but uh, we had the first time we completed, um, uh, last week the teams completed heart, liver, and kidney transplants, all three and all doing well. Uh, the hospital performed its first heart transplant earlier this year, only the second VA to do heart transplants. And we started a uh, liver transplant program in 2007 and a kidney transplant there program in 2013. Uh, and it's just a great program and really proud of all of the physicians that work at the VA uh, and uh, that group. Uh, it's a strong affiliation for us. I also want to congratulate the seventh graders uh, to the Baylor College of Medicine Biotech Academy at Rusk who donned their blue coats. And the blue coat for them, like the white coats for us, represents their entry in the uh, field of health profession. So very excited for them, uh, and it's a very, it's a very cool ceremony uh, for these seventh graders. Also want to remind all the uh, faculty and staff that our open enrollment ends October 16th uh, at 11.59 p.m. So remember, this is the one chance you have to change your health plan, your flex flexible spending accounts, health savings accounts, and other benefits. There's going to be an eclipse Saturday, a partial eclipse on Saturday, October 14th. And I guess I shouldn't have to remind you, don't look directly in the sun. I mean, occasionally even presidents look directly in the sun, but uh, don't forget to, to be, watch, look at it only indirectly. So Lily, it, hopefully we'll be back now that the rider strike is resolved. Unfortunately, the actors are still out, but Lily's thinking about coming back as long as we meet her demands, which includes updating her dressing room, better chairs, better working hours, better food. We're trying to meet all those demands, so Lily will come back on the set. Extended to the postseason for Houston. The 3-2. Hurt! Caught on three. And the Astros, for a seventh consecutive season, are headed to the American League Championship Series for a matchup in the Lone Star State with the Texas Rangers. Back, 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 back. It could go all the way. Well, anyway. Congratulations to the Astros for winning once again uh, the playoff series and are in the championship series. Go Astros. Hope you have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you.